Welcome to the 24th Annual Writers Symposium by the Sea at Point Loma Nazarene University. I'm Dean Nelson on the journalism faculty, and with us tonight is E.J. Dion, a political writer who has a column in the Washington Post. Uh, prior to that, he was with the New York Times. He's one of the reasonable voices in American political discourse today. His, uh, his books range from his first book, which was a bestseller, Why Americans Hate Politics, and his most recent book is One Nation After Trump, A Guide for the Perplexed, the Disillusioned, the Desperate, and the Not Yet Deported. <laughs> and he has several in between. He teaches at Georgetown and Harvard Universities. He's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Many people don't recognize his face, but recognize his voice. If you hear him speak, you think, I think I've heard that voice on NPR, and you're right. He and David Brooks do a weekly uh, recap of the, day, the week's events on Fridays on NPR. Uh, E.J. Dion, welcome to our symposium. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's great to be here. Thank you. <laughs> you would have been my favorite history or civics teacher in high school. Reading your stuff, I just think, oh my gosh, this guy makes it interesting. While I was reading your books, I just thought, I would have done so much better in high school if you would have been my teacher. Oh and my I would have given you a really good grade. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I knew we were gonna get along. But, but you, you just connect all these dots to history and you, and you say this led to that and you come with such knowledge. But that isn't the part that surprised me the most. The part that surprised me the most was so many books like the kind you write come out of a certain level of uh, maybe anger or rage or, or they're just these polemics. You, you write with a certain level, and I'm choosing this word carefully, I would call it joy. You write about politics and history and where things came from with a certain joy. And if joy isn't the right word, then it's either respect or enthusiasm. And I'm just thinking, the present political climate is so full of outrage and offense and violation, but you're writing it from a place of love. Where in the world is that coming from? See, after that, I don't think I should say anything at all tonight. <laughs> I think he should just keep talking. It, no, it's, uh, that, that, that was so sweet. You have, uh, a love, you. <laughs> you have a love for democracy and for the political process. Well, a couple of things, I mean, how do you respond to something that sweet? But a, a couple of things in response. One is I want to shout out all the teachers in this room, including the professors here. I had two really extraordinary history teachers in high school. I have a strong teacher bias. My mom was a teacher. My sister taught for a while. And um, American history was just something, even before I went to high school, it was just something I ate up. I don't know, people here are old enough to remember these remarkable series they had for kids, landmark books, anybody remember those? Or we were their books, and anything that was history and politics. And the other thing is I grew up in a very political household and a political extended family. I always said our family broke the two basic rules. You're not supposed to talk about religion or politics at the dinner table. We always talked about religion and politics uh, at the dinner table. And Argument was something seen as something good, not bad. Yeah. Um, it's one of the favorite columns I ever got to write. But my dad died in 1968. I was 16, and when people honor, as they should, uh, Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King, uh, I always say a third grade American died in 1968. My dad, and my dad encouraged me to argue with him. He encouraged me to take issue with him. It wasn't vicious, it was the opposite of what you see now. He thought it was good for a kid to have an independent view, and he thought the process of argument ought to be educational. And so we would have, an, we would have a wonderful time arguing about politics and why back then our dear Boston Red Sox were losing. I yeah. wish he had lived long enough to see these days now in Boston sports. So there was a joy and then 
Uh, last point on that, I think, is the late Mary McGrory, the wonderful columnist uh, for the Washington Post, once said that every baby born in Massachusetts is born with a campaign manager's gene. You know, that we were all very political. And in Massachusetts, people still remember 20 years ago that you were on the wrong side of a state legislative race, yeah. you know? But it was, politics was sort of part of life. It was a normal thing people did. And I appreciated joy as one of my favorite words. I think it's a- Well, it comes a, through a, in your writing. And I do, take joy in politics even when it's bad, as, right. and at the moment we have a lot of problems. And yeah. I, I do feel so I, I am not immune to rage, uh, and I've had a lot more of that of late, because I think there is a lot to be upset about. But you can be angry and think things should change, and I think still take some joy in the way democracy is supposed to work and the fact that democracy gives people opportunities to turn things around fairly quickly, which the country did last November. Sure. Although, I will say this. You got a little cranky with, uh, let's see, which book was it? Oh, Stand Up and Fight Back. You got a little cranky in that book. Maybe that was, that was one of your less joyful books. Yeah, I, well, I was mad about Iraq. I was mad about that what had happened. In, the, in that period of the Bush administration. I think what really bothered me in that period was a sense that the, um, the national unity we had as a country after 9-11 got politicized twice over. It got politicized uh, to justify the Iraq war, which was a mistake, I believe, and it got politicized again for the purposes of an election. Sure. And it was, it was particularly sad because for the first couple of months, after 9-11, I, I, and I did this in my column, I actually gave President Bush credit for not politicizing it in the early days. And that, you know, I, I remember doing some columns where I was talking to Democrats on the Hill and saying, you know, Bush could have rolled us on this and this and this, and he didn't. And we really had this sense mm -hmm. as a country that we were going to take this in and, um, you know, and try to turn it into something positive. Uh, and that didn't happen. It became partisan. So I was very upset when I wrote that yeah. book. Yeah, I want to go back to your teachers just for a second. Who was Sister Genevieve? So Sister Genevieve, I, I went to uh, Catholic schools for the first 12 years of my life. And I went to our uh, parish school called St. Matthew's. The parish has been closed since then. Um, and Sister Genevieve was my sixth grade teacher. And I always say that she gave me my first real lesson in civil rights. Uh, because here we were in a New England school where everybody in, who taught in the school either spoke with a New England accent or a heavy French-Canadian accent. It was a French-Canadian Catholic parish. And Sister Genevieve spoke with this very deep Southern drawl. And it was like, what are you doing here, Sister? Mm -hmm. And it turned out that Sister Genevieve had been in the South and had organized an integrated, a racially integrated First Communion and that went over very badly. And the notion that there would be objections to a racially integrated First Communion was, is mind boggling. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, and she was just this extraordinary sweet woman. And you think, ah, there's a militant nun. She wasn't militant, she was just a Christian. She just believed that the, you know, all of God's children should be created equally. And so, what a concept. She had a real, what a concept, you know? And so she had a real. Uh, you know, there were a lot of my teachers had a real impact on me. She was one yeah. of them. You and I both got interested in politics, I think, uh, when George McGovern uh, ran for president, or in the political process when George, for me, it was because I heard his campaign manager speak at my college, and that campaign manager was Gary Hart. So, speaking of Hart, there was a movie made about him and his presidential run last year called The Front Runner. You are portrayed in that movie as a young black man named AJ. I was honored by the portrayal, yeah. I gotta say. So what went through your head when you saw that? Well, I haven't seen the movie yet. Oh, so come I have on. To, no, I haven't, I haven't, I've gotta go. That whole period actually was painful. I just wanna go, go back. I, I should make a disclosure about the McGovern period. I was actually, 
uh, an alternate delegate at that convention. I was elected as an alternate McGovern delegate for my district in Massachusetts in 1972. Wow. And um, we, it, it, was a, it was a fascinating campaign. There were, I worked on a lot of anti-war campaigns when I was in college. Uh, including a congressional race for a wonderful guy who kind of became my second father after my dad died. But Gary, um, so the story that my friend Dean here is alluding to is that um, I was by then, when Gary Hart ran for president, um, uh, the second time I was a national political reporter for the New York Times and was writing a, um, a profile of him for the New York Times Magazine, a long profile, and, and it was actually my first real uh, knowledge of Nazarenes, because of course Gary Hart got raised as a Nazarene, and I visited his uh, Nazarene college, Bethany Nazarene, I you believe it was, Good memory. Um, and talked to the guy who had been his professor, who had been a very influential professor. So I've been in, interested in Nazarenes ever since I wrote that piece back in 1987. Um, but the story that got a lot of attention is, I am the guy Gary Hart said, follow me around, you'll be bored to. If, for those of you who are old enough uh, to remember, um, uh, that uh, I did this interview and wrote the piece, and it was only one line in a piece that was fairly quite positive about Hart, about how intelligent he was. I read the story, um, it was a good although, story. Although, you know, it, it raised some questions. Um, you know, his sex life was mentioned in that quote, and that was basically it. And I debated very much at the time whether I should do it at all, because I don't particularly like the idea of people, of candidate sex lives becoming central to politics, unless there is a really good reason for it. Um, but I felt that at the time you could tell this story was developing, and it would have been a mistake not to mention it, and I thought it would have been a mistake to dwell on it. Well, the Sunday, that my piece appeared formally in your New York Times, the um, Miami Herald, um, who had reported a story based on a stakeout they did at Gary Hart's house that began two nights before the, the formal publication of that magazine piece, mm -hmm. although uh, about three days after it was printed. So the quote was out there theoretically for anybody who could grab a New York Times magazine and it appeared in their story, but the yeah. actual magazine didn't appear till that day, and they discovered that Gary Hart was in the house with a woman who is not his wife, yeah. and it set off a crazy week that led to Hart's uh, withdrawal, and I still never felt great about that whole period. Well, in fact, uh, a lot of people say that political journalism changed in that moment, in that coverage of Gary Hart, uh, that it changed forever that the scandal of his marriage, his sex life, all that, would you agree that political journalism changed with that event? I think it did, although I think it would inevitably have changed over time at some point. Okay. Um, that, that, that was the big bang, yeah. but it happened because there were a series of changes. Um, you know, and if you talk to um, a lot of uh, women political reporters, they will make the point that you know, they're, they're, on the one side, there is the view that this sort of tabloidized politics, and in a way it did. Um, but the other side, which I've heard from women colleagues, is that journalism was a kind of old boys club that where men protected other men and did not have these kind of stories. And I think when you look at the Me Too movement now, uh, I think that this change was likely to happen at some point. And sure. as I say, I have very mixed feelings about it because I've, I've been persuaded by my uh, female colleagues that there was something wrong with the boys club aspect right. of it. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I'm kind of an old fashioned person in liking campaigns based on issues and that sort of thing. And yeah. that didn't, there was something about this that always jarred. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, and I think, uh, the other part of it that bothers me is I think it's almost random who gets caught in these matters, that we all know, um, you know, there are plenty of politicians who have not led, shall we say, perfect personal lives, and yet some of them uh, come under scrutiny and some of them never mm -hmm. do. Sure. Uh, and you wonder what is the rationale? Why does this person get called out and that person not sure. get called out? Sure, sure. You know, in, in, your, in your new book, One Nation After Trump, 
you call for a new kind of patriotism. What does that patriotism look like? Well, the, the book is with my colleagues, I should say, uh, Tom Mann and Norm Ornstein. And mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of fun writing this book with three authors, two coasts, four months. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a really fascinating. We've been, fortunately, two fortunate things. One, we had been friends for a long time. And two, writing this book together did not wreck our friendship. We actually ended up better friends at the end of it all. Cool. Um, we, in the back half of that book, we felt it wasn't enough to just sort of list the things that were wrong with Trump, why we should be worried about his presidency, and also explain why we thought he got elected. But we wanted to offer a way forward. So we had, in the last half of the book, is what we came to refer to as our four news. And we called for a new economy, a new democracy, a new patriotism, and a new civil society. And I won't go through all of them. Um, I'll just say the new democracy is a lot of reform measures to make the country more democratic, to end gerrymandering, to uh, fix up the way campaigns are financed, pass voting rights, a lot of things there, a new economy, Clearly, um, economic inequality helped contribute to Trump's election, uh, and we have a series of things there. A new patriotism we felt was important because um, we were trying to draw a distinction between nationalism and patriotism, between a kind of ethno-nationalism that excluded people within our own borders uh, and implied a... Um, a sense of the nation that was aggressive rather than simply proud. And we use the word patriotism as an alternative to this because an honest love of country is a good thing. That, sure. and, that we, and that we felt that uh, progressives and liberals are often uneasy with a love of country. And some of it is reasonable when we, uh, there was a backlash after World War II against the very idea of nationalism because of Nazi Germany, because of fascist Italy, because of the real damage nationalism caused. On the, but, but the other side of it is that an affection for your country, an affection for your place, and especially an affection for America as it has become, an America that is, has become more equal, an America that is deeply diverse, an America that does uphold the ideas of democracy and freedom, that guarantees free speech, we think we should be proud of this and that there's, um, and that it's important politically to set up that kind of love of country against an ethno-nationalism that is trying to exclude and put people down. In fact, you go back to Orwell's definitions of patriotism and nationalism, right? Right. So which are what? Well, that Orwell basically saw um, nationalism as implying a certain aggressiveness, a desire to have your country be dominant, a desire to put down other nations, whereas patriotism is a person's honest love uh, for the place they're from or the place they've embraced, for its values, for its culture, uh, for an appreciation of a place. I, and I always think about it as uh, your, your family um, and others. You can love your family more than you love anyone else in a very particular way. That does not exclude the possibility that there are many other people in the world that you love, but you will love your family in a special way. Similarly, there are, I've had the good fortune to travel and work abroad. There are a lot of other countries I actually have enormous affection and respect for, but I love mine in a special way, just like I love my family in a special way. Sure. And I don't think uh, anybody, liberal, conservative, moderate, should in any way feel badly about having a special love for the place that is theirs. Sure. Well, it, uh, along the same line of, of patriotism, you, you have this quote in there. The path to a new patriotism passes through a new spirit of empathy. What does empathy mean? You're big on empathy. I know you are. So you've got to explain what you mean by it um, you and, why, and why that's connected to patriotism. You asked that question with great empathy. I appreciate it. The, um, <laughs> I have so no idea wanna, what you just I, said. I, I, I tell a story about that. I, I uh, was appearing, I was on a panel with my friend David Brooks at Wash U before one of the debates that they had there in 2016 uh, that Krista Tippett moderated, if many of you may be fans of Krista's. Uh, I am. 
Um, and in the middle of it, I just sort of blurted out that if I had a hat, my hat would say, make America empathetic again. And a lovely man came up at the end of the event and said, I love that line about empathy. You're going to hear from me. And about three weeks later, a perfect replica of the Trump hat arrived in the mail at my house, at our house, uh, with Make America Empathetic Again on it. And my son happened to be visiting at home. He said, Dad, that's an awesome hat, but you can't wear it because from a distance it looks like a Trump hat. Uh, but I still treasure it. I have it at yeah, home. But, but, and that but hold on. What, is, what does empathy have to do with winning? Aren't we all about winning? The, Don't we, we want to win everything. So why are you, why, what's the big thing about well, empathy? But, uh, partly, I do think empathy can actually help winning, but that's, that, that's, not the, that's obviously not the point I was making at the time. I think we have in, an increasingly difficult time identifying with people very different from us, with different views from us, with different life experiences uh, from us. And Bill Bishop, in his great book, The Big Sort, talked about how we don't even live near people who disagree with us about politics, about religion. We have tended to um, cocoon ourselves quite efficiently, surrounding ourselves with people of the same worldview. Um, and our, my view is that we are suffering a kind of crisis of empathy in the country. And just to sort of do two sides of the coin, it ought not be difficult uh, to understand the anger felt by someone in Appalachia or an old mill town uh, who felt they had made a deal with the economy that would allow them to work hard, get paid decently, get a decent retirement, and see their kids be able to stay in their own community and have a decent living. It ought not to be difficult to understand why that person might be angry when the rug was pulled out from under them. Similarly, it should not be hard for anyone to understand how an African-American parent would get very angry because they can't be sure if their 16-year-old son goes out at night unarmed, he might still get shot by a policeman. Now, these are two very different groups. These were groups on opposite sides in the last election. Yet it ought not to be so hard uh, to identify with these two groups. And so we argued that a new patriotism is rooted in a new empathy because we need to restore our sense of we again uh, as a country. I always like to ask audiences, just because I like to hear the sound of the answer, what is the first word of the Constitution of the United States? We. Yes, that's exactly. We don't say we enough. Thank you very much <laughs> for that. We don't say we enough uh, anymore as a country. We the people are those first words. And so I, I am looking for political leadership that wants us to say we a lot more than we say us and them. So how do we do it? How, we have a politics of resentment and a politics of annihilation. How do we get past that? You can't just say, let's all get empathetic. Uh, well, you could. Well, yeah, <laughs> but I would um, resent you for it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, we have had politicians in the past who have done it. I am. Uh, um, you know, ever since I was a kid, I've been an admirer of Robert Kennedy. And I think mm -hmm. you go back to Robert Kennedy's campaign in 1968. And that was a period of deep, deep national division over Vietnam, over race. And the there was a backlash to the success of civil rights. Um, and here was Kennedy campaigning through, notably, uh, Indiana, uh, where he spoke, he had the trust of both African Americans uh, and white working class voters in that state. And I'm sure a lot of people in the room have seen that extraordinary um, short speech Kennedy gave the night that uh, Martin Luther King got killed. And to have a white politician be able to look at an Afri angry African American cra crowd and say, my brother was killed by a white man. Uh, there was a kind of sense of connection that Kennedy could create. And I also think that you created in a practical way uh, when you think about what is ailing, uh, what has ailed uh, inner city America, and what has ailed many of the predominantly white working class communities. Both have been hammered by the process of deindustrialization. And we can argue whether it's trade or whether it's technological change uh, or some combination of the two. 
Uh, but the fact is, you know, 30 years ago, William J. Wilson, a great uh, African-American scholar, wrote a book called When Work Disappears. And it was about the hollowing out of the economy of inner cities because of deindustrialization. Mm -hmm. uh, Donald Trump won the election the last time in part because the very process that Bill Wilson described the inner city had affected towns like Reading and Erie and other, and in parts of Appalachia. We ought to be able to say, wait a minute, these two communities have suffered um, uh, setbacks from some of the same forces can't we speak about their problems in common? Now, there are very particular problems that communities have. Racism is a reality that African-American communities face that, wh that white people do not face. But that you can acknowledge that reality, but still say there are forces that are hurting both these communities, and we ought to solve the problems that hurt both of them at the same time, because in many cases, they are the same problem. Sure. Uh, I mean, we. Everybody's going to agree with all of that's an issue, and we got to do something about it. Except just if I can interrupt, I, honestly, we have a president right now who is consciously trying to divide us along these lines day after day after day. And I think the difference between President Trump and even presidents we've had in the past whom I've disagreed with very much is they didn't have as the basis of their political strategy the need for division. So I, I, I want to say everybody doesn't agree with that because we have a president who is pursuing, I think, a very conscious strategy of dividing us. OK, OK. No, no that's, that's a good point. But, so set that aside just for a second. I, would, I just want to look at the, the, the decades, over the decades. So you wrote in Why Americans Hate Politics in 1991. I think that, that's when that came out. So I am getting old. Well, well. <laughs> It, it dealt with things about civil rights, integration of minorities into political and economic life, values of feminism and sexuality and child rearing, and the ongoing debate over endless wars. I read those as the themes of your book in 1991, and I'm thinking, and it could have been said today. Why have we not gotten anywhere? Well, I think we have gotten somewhere um, that, you know, Think of, for example, advances in LGBTQ rights. This is not an issue that was even uh, on the agenda. Um, while there have certainly been um, some real setbacks on the civil rights front, we have actually become, I think, by most measures, a more inclusive country. I mean, that, that the 2016 election marks a certain break point, but I think we are a more inclusive country. I think that the, when you think about the role of women in our society, look at the Democratic race for president, how many of the leading candidates are women, are women of color. We have two candidates of color. We've got a um, gay married military veteran running for president. We have a Latino. I mean, I think that we have made some real progress in important spheres. I think that we have, on the other hand, had real regression when it comes uh, to the distribution of the fruits of our economy. We got a bigger economy. We have had enormous uh, technological change, some of which is quite extraordinary. The, my, the little device I carry around, we carry around in our pockets, have more information than we could have dreamt possible having at our fingertips. But the way that economy has worked out has created uh, new inequalities. So we have to deal with those new inequalities. OK. So we are making progress since 1991. In certain 1991. spheres, we're making progress. In other spheres, we have new problems we need to sure. solve. One of your other themes is this perpetual tension between wanting, people wanting personal liberty and also wanting a strong community that shares burdens and responsibilities. And I've heard you, I've heard you characterize this as, we are both, this land is your land, and I did it my way. We are, we, we are, we are both that. Can we really have both? And if so, how do we get there? Um, I, I think all we live in, I think America and Americans live with a constant and at its best productive tension uh, between our respect for individualism and our yearning for community. And I use those two songs because they both speak very much to the American character. Um, you know, this, is, this was the theme of, um, of my book, Our Divided Political Heart, that we have these two sides 
of us. And uh, Paul Begala, whom some of you know from CNN, uh, the Democratic speechwriter, um, wrote very kindly about that book. And he told the great story of how in Texas, where he did a lot of political work, two speeches that a politician could give down there were always uh, winners. Speech one was, my family came down here. We were on our own. We built this ranch ourselves. We built this into a going enterprise. And it was all our hard work. And then the other story that's always a winner is, we came down here in wagon trains. We protected each other. We looked out for each other. We had each other's backs. When we got to town, the first thing we built was a church, and the second thing we built was a school. And if the barn was burned down, neighbors would come to give it. Those are the two American stories, one about individualism, one about community. And I think that you, there's a dynamic tension in our history, in our country, in ourselves, uh, between those two forces. And they each have benefits, and they each need to be corrected by the other. Um, you know, an excess of community can become kind of authoritarian or totalitarianism, totalitarian, mm -hmm. and an excess of individualism can become an anomic, selfish society where uh, no one has anyone to do with anyone else. It's, you know, it's, um, it is uh, Pottersville versus Bedford Falls in It's a Wonderful Life. I think so many answers to political questions are contained in the movie It's a Wonderful Life. This is, uh, all right, we gotta go there. I, <laughs> I know this is one of your favorite movies, so tell us why. Well, I, I've argued, even though Frank Capra actually was fairly conservative, I've, I've always argued it was the ultimate New Deal movie. Uh, because why? it was, it showed the value of rough equality, a, d a degree, a decent degree of economic equality within a broadly capitalist uh, economy. That uh, George Bailey understands that everyone wants a little, uh, wants their own stake, wants a roof over their head. So he runs the savings and loan that helps out all of the working people in the community to have decent homes. Uh, and what follows from that, by the way, for those who love traditional values, uh, is a very healthy uh, community. People mm -hmm. look out for each other. George is happily married with a million kids in this old house. Um, and uh, then you shift to Mr. Potter's vision, where it's about nothing but money. It's about nothing but accumulation. Those people, that whole area that George Bailey helped build uh, doesn't exist. And the result of a lack of basic equality and opportunity uh, is that the town becomes this sullen, corrupt place it, you know, with prostitution and gambling. And it's just this ugly picture when George disappears from the world. And so I think what we forget about the need for economic fairness uh, and a degree of equality in the distribution of the good things in life is that the good society, including good values, uh, actually have to be rooted in a particular kind of economy. Uh, and the George Bailey economy is a heck of a lot better than the Mr. Potter economy. It's really about economics. Yeah, I, well, I do think it's about economics. It's, right. about Fair the, enough. Uh, it's about love, it's about Clarence the angel. Every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. You can't forget that part. <laughs> I'm gonna go with economics. So. <laughs> So you We're at a Nazarene school, you gotta believe in angels. Yeah, all right, all right, all right. So you've you've written a lot about conservatives. You're not a conservative, but you've written a lot about conservatives. Why they're wrong, why they're dysfunctional, why they're on the verge of collapse. It seems to me that they're winning a lot. So what uh, how wrong could they be if they keep winning? That's what I always say about the New England Patriots, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I, I am interested, for, I'm interested in conservatism in part from an early age because I grew up in a conservative family. And right. so I have been fascinated by conservatism uh, right, you know, from the beginning. Um, and I take conservatism very seriously. I mean, there are, I do find a lot to admire in people like Edmund Burke and in conservative thinkers like Edmund Burke. Um, you know, William, I, I pray that I could be 5% as effective as William F. Buckley uh, was as a column writer and as somebody who upchanged our political conversation. 
Um, and I think that progressives need the correction of conservatives, uh, even if you are a progressive, which I am, and believe we need to take steps to solve these problems. Uh, I think the conservative view of having a certain skepticism about human nature is useful. I think having somebody challenge grand planners is useful because grand plans can go awry. Uh, and I think having a certain respect for tradition is useful, although that often has to be challenged because tradition can also be used to keep whole groups of people down. So I, I, th so I think the conservative disposition is necessary for a successful polity. I just don't happen to want it to be dom the dominant, um, the dominant uh, feature. As far as their being successful, it depends kind of on how you want to date things. Um, that if you take uh, you know 1992 to 2008, uh, conservatives were in power for eight years and liberals or progressives or new Democrats were in power for 16 years. If you look at um, you know, states in the Electoral College, uh, until Trump broke that lock, there was a very long period of, uh, of a lot of uh, progressive power. But yes, we, we have been um, in the middle of this fight. And I guess I've written about conservatism a lot, and I wrote a book called Why the Right Went Wrong, um, because I think conservatism radicalized in ways that are dangerous to conservatism, but really dangerous uh, to the country. I think the beginning, um, uh, beginning after George H.W. Bush's defeat, um, conservatism became um, less and less interested in trying at least to find some consensus to solve certain problems. I think with the Gingrich Congress in 94, uh, and this is what my friends Tom Mann and Norm Ornstein argued in a book of their own, um, they, the conservative movement really became a kind of what they called an insurgent outlier uh, in politics. Uh, and so I've been very upset uh, what's, about what's happened to conservatism. I'd like uh, a kind of conservatism that was constructive. I, I'm, I admire Dwight Eisenhower, for example. You are very I'm kind, a, I'm book I, after book. I, I like Eisenhower. I admired, say, the conservatism of Harold Macmillan um, in uh, Britain or of Conrad Adenauer in, uh, uh, in Germany, where I thought it was a conservatism that accepted the idea that capitalism needed the correction of a state that would try to right the inequalities that capitalism inevitably uh, produces, that would try uh, to use the phrase that uh, I guess Obama was always criticized for, that spreading the wealth around is not a bad thing, that actually the survival of capitalism depends upon a decent distribution. Otherwise, there's no purchasing power for the masses, which is not good for the economy, or there is massive revolt, which people with power and money should not want to see. Sure. Well, all right, so let me shift over to the news media for a minute. Um, in your book, They Only Look Dead, you have this, the, I know, it's just the great, it, uh, it's a great line. Um, the subtitle is Why Progressives Will Dominate the Next Political Era. And I always say that when people stop laughing at that title, progressives actually will be dominating the next political era. All right, but you've got this line that I, I just love, and, and I want to, I have just a brief quarrel, a minor quarrel with it. In a literal sense, you say, we journalists no longer know what we're doing. There is no consensus on what the goals of journalism are, nor is there agreement as to whom or what we are obligated. So my quarrel with that statement is just the, the use of the words no longer. There, I don't think there's ever been a clear definition of what we do. You think there is? You, you think we're the no longer, I'm not so sure we've always known what we were doing. Well, I think there's always been a debate about what journalism is, sure. Exactly. And that, you know, if you look at our own history for the first 100, probably 120 years, almost all journalism was partisan journalism. And it wasn't until the late, um, the, the late 1800s uh, two, where two things happened. One is some smart entrepreneurs realized that instead of running a party-oriented paper, if you wrote stories, 
that appealed to a broad audience and then sold advertising around the stories, you could make a lot more money. Thus, Pulitzer, yes, for th example. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you, um, Joseph. And then also came along um, in the early 20th century, Walter Lippmann, um, who very much believed that uh, you needed a journalism that was like science. Can you imagine he compared journalists to scientists? Uh, but his idea was that our job was to sort of get as accurate and objective a view of what was happening. And the reason he sort of became a strong supporter of this idea of objective journalism, a term much debated uh, over the last uh, 50 years, um, was uh, the experience of World War I, where he wrote a very critical book of how a lot of journalism of World War I was just jingoistic mm -hmm. propaganda. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we've had these debates. I wrote that in 94 because I think we were in the midst of the first of several big wrenching changes. It was after, uh, it was just when the new partisan media was starting to rise. It's when the AM radio dial came to be colonized uh, by conservative uh, talk radio. Mm -hmm. um, and if I could just say one other word about Lippmann, there was a great debate between Lippmann and John Dewey, the philosopher in the 20s, about whether people um, sort of acted politically because they got the facts and then thought about them and then were moved to action, or on Dewey's side, if people developed a thirst for the facts from political engagement. And Dewey's oh, right. was a much more sort of small d democratic view of how this process worked. And when I wrote that sentence, I, I, I sort of want to, I, 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 I still want to preserve a um, Lippmannite world where we can have accurate, reasonably objective, or fair-minded reporting or at least of what's neutral. out there, at least agreed upon facts. Yeah, yeah. Um, at the same time, I don't mourn the rise of a certain amount of partisan media alongside that. I don't want the partisan media to kill that, but the partisan media is mobilizing. It mobilizes people to political action, like those old partisan papers did a long time ago. And I'd sort of like to see these two worlds coexist. And so at that point, I was talking about how um, we literally didn't know what we were doing, because I think we were in the middle of the transition that we are still going through now. Well, and you've come out very strongly over the years that good journalism actually protects democracy. So can you explain what you mean by that? Right, well, there, there are several ways in which good journalism protects democracy. The obvious uh, is that good journalism holds governments at all levels accountable. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when I think of the crisis of journalism, one of the things I worry about most is not at the national level, but at the pressure on local papers around the country to cut back on coverage of state houses, to cut back on coverage of city halls. Uh, and there are just fewer people working at this work because the business model isn't supporting them. Uh, and so I think the accountability function uh, is extremely important. And that just doesn't mean uh, investigative journalism to find corruption. It's just accountability so people can actually know the basic things that are going on in their mm -hmm. uh, government. So that's, um, uh, th that's the first. The second is, um, and we were talking about this with some of your students today, um, that I think good journalism promotes better arguments. Uh, that I think democracy, in a sense, is one big ongoing argument about how do you fix problems, how do you think about the future, what kind of country or city or town uh, do we want to be. Um, and good journalism provides the facts uh, that, that feed that argument, so you can be arguing about real things as opposed to made up things. And good, good newspapers provide forums, uh, as well as good media of other kinds, uh, provide forums where people can carry out these debates uh, and these arguments. Um, and uh, again, Dewey was somebody who said argument is the essence of education. Uh, and in a good argument, you almost, in a good argument, not competing uh, assertions passing each other in the night, which is a lot of what passes for argument now, 
But in good argument, when you're, you, you have to enter imaginatively into the ideas of your opponents, uh, and this is great, the historian Christopher Lash observed this, that you enter imaginatively into the ideas of opponent, your opponent initially to refute them, but in the process of that, you put your own ideas at risk because you're really trying to take on what are they thinking, what facts are they putting on the table that might contradict my point of view. That whole process, when it works, and it doesn't always work, but right. when it works, should be educational to people on both ends of the argument. That's an idealized view of argument, but it's what argument really should be. Which is what would make it... Uh, a, essential a, to democracy. Essential to democracy. So another, another force really helped shape you, uh, not only in your political views, but, uh, but in your practice as a journalist, and that was uh, your practice of religion. And uh, I think it was a Martin Luther King Jr. book that, that some lights came on when you read, uh, when you read that. So how does, how does your faith inform your journalism or your political views? It's kind of you to mention the King story so that one of you, we all have these moments in life, you might call them light bulb moments or moments of grace. Mm -hmm. and. I was uh, in a religion class, a, th a Christian doctrine class in my Benedictine high school, and the priest uh, who taught the class asked us to pick any religious book we wanted to pick to write a book report about. And it was in, at the height of Martin Luther King's ministry and political action, and I picked his book of sermons, Strength to Love. Um, now, that's a great title. I, I just when that it actually takes strength to love. Um, but it was uh, just a remarkable little book of his sermons, and it opened up a world for me. I grew up, one of my friends from my hometown is in the audience, bless you for coming. Um, the, my hometown was about 99% white. It was a white working class town. So we didn't have a lot of experience of the civil rights movement in our town. I had not, uh, experience the African American church's emphasis on exodus and liberation, uh, or the emphasis on prophets like I Isaiah, Micah, Amos, calling the world to justice. Um, and, you know, and from there, it became an engagement with King in other ways. Um, you know, and a, uh, I, I remember the old technology, the record. Uh, I remember going into a supermarket and buying a for 99 cents, I think, an LP of the speeches at the Great Civil Rights March uh, of 1963. And I listened over and over and over again to the I Have a Dream speech. And this just really affected my worldview uh, in a very, uh, very deep way. Um, and then the, I guess I've always seen, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure how I've linked my um, religion to my journalism, although I did get to cover the Vatican and I always tell students that one of the most useful courses, I, professionally useful courses I took in college was a course in which I read the liberation theologians. Uh, and um, uh, when I covered the Vatican, those very people I had read about 15 years earlier were being condemned by the Vatican. So I actually knew quite a lot about what was- You knew what they were doing. What, yeah. what, was, uh, what was going on here. But I think of religion, I know this will sound strange to some ears, a religion's a search for truth, too. Uh, I think people who take religion seriously are trying to understand as best they can uh, the nature of the universe and, uh, and where the universe came from, trying to understand what forces like love. It, does love exist at the center of the universe, or is it a random uh, set, is it based on a random set of actions? And those kinds of conversations that you have with yourself if you're interested in religion, I think are partly about a, they, are, they too are a, a quest for truth. But you can, you can understand why someone would, would look at this with a certain level of cynicism to say, right, and religion has also become weaponized in that in the name of religion, somebody shoots up a synagogue, in the name of religion, somebody uh, sets fire to a Planned Parenthood clinic or flies an airplane into a building. That's religion, too. Oh, that's completely right. I, I mean, it is, you know, religion can unite or divide. Uh, religion can lead to the most loving acts imaginable and some of the most hateful acts. Um, 
And yet, I would argue that um, I think in many cases, it's religion being weaponized on behalf of something other than religion. It's religion being used for nationalism. It's religion being used to justify bigotry. I don't know how you can do that, but people have tried to do that. Um, it's not necessarily uh, religion uh, itself. You know, I, I've, I've, I've often wondered what would the world be like if the events recounted in the four Gospels, which were not written in real time, as we know. They were written anywhere from 40 to 200 years after the events described. What would the world be like if we had video of all of that? And how would we think about it? And yet, you know, I think of, you know, a lot of the biblical scholars are also kind of like journalists because they are trying to take the written records that we have, imperfect though they are, and trying to compare them to other facts that we know about the period and trying to get an accounting, for example, of which words that are ascribed to Jesus in the scripture are words we can be quite sure he spoke, that we think he might have spoken, or that were probably put into his mouth by the tradition uh, mm -hmm. later on. Mm -hmm. Now, for some people, if you begin to explore like that, it can undercut your faith. I don't think it has to. In fact, you know, it's written right there, the truth will make you free. I'd rather know the truth. Yeah, okay. So uh, I'm thinking of people who will be watching this uh, who might be politically minded, um, maybe young people who are wondering if they want to get engaged in the political process and they look at how divisive and how polarized and how hateful things are, why would anybody want to go into politics in the present day? Well, you know, a lot of people decided between 2016 and 2018 to get involved in politics. There was an extraordinary outpouring of uh, organization and mobilization all over our country. There were communities that had uh, never seen, for example, any political action by Democrats, where suddenly small groups of people, usually led by women, uh, met in libraries and church basements and, pub and uh, diners and said, you know, we have let this go far enough. We've got to turn this around. I was speaking to somebody in the audience earlier who made that decision that it was time to organize. And there was a lot of that uh, going on all over the country. Um, and I think that um, there's George Will and I, I, I agree with George Will a lot on baseball. I don't agree with him a lot on politics. But both of us are very fond of a Max Weber line that politics is the long, slow boring of hard boards. That politics takes time, change takes time, organizing uh, needs to be painstaking. But there can be real joy in it. There can be real fellowship uh, in it. And I think over the last two years, um, as the scholar Theodor Scotchpole has shown, who's really studied a lot of these groups, people realized that change was possible. That, and they saw it on election night. Uh, they saw it actually on election night in 2017. You already saw uh, the beginnings of change in a lot of local elections in 2017. You saw it again in 2018. Um, you know, democracy is permeable. Democracy at least creates the possibility uh, that you can take some power in your own hands. And in my experience, most people who have engaged in political action, some people get disillusioned, but most people come away saying, you know, it's actually pretty good to exercise some power, and it's really good to exercise some power in alliance with friends and neighbors, and you can begin to change a country that way. So similarly, why would, what would you say to somebody who is considering going into journalism? Why would anybody want to do that today? Oh, because of the enormous pay and economic opportunity, <laughs> you know. <laughs> the, um, why else? <laughs> the, um, I think the, to have someone pay you some money uh, to go out in the world and talk to absolutely anyone you want what from in any walk of life, in any class, in any uh, social class, in any part of the country or the world, that's an amazing thing. 
uh, and that's a joyful thing to pick up uh, mm -hmm. your word. That's a lot of fun. Uh, to you, I mean, you you have to like to write or talk. That's part of just uh, like to make a piece of furniture. You got to be able to hold a hammer and nail a nail, which is something mm -hmm. I'm not good at. Um, uh, and um, you get a chance to see up close the way institutions work, whether they be governmental institutions, businesses, unions, sports teams. Um, and you can learn every day is a learning day <laughs> of one kind uh, or another. And you, uh, you also learn to be really good at finding people who don't want you to find them. That's a particular side skill that I uh, commend. Um, I once, I, 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 was, I was working on the New York Times early in my career. I was working kind of night shift kind of thing. And we had to match a story by another paper. And I had to find somebody who was allegedly getting appointed to a job. And nobody knew where he was, although somebody told me he was skiing. And I found in his wedding announcement that he owned a ski place up in Vermont. So I called the ski place, assumed that's where he was, and just asked if he was there. And somebody said, no, he's on the slopes. And the guy called me back, confirmed the story, and said, you can come work for me if you want, because no one knew I was here. And I don't know how you found me. And it was in the wedding announcement that <laughs> Uh, so, you know, where else can you have joy like that? That's, that's um, awesome. So anyway, I, I just think it's a, it, it's a very exciting, satisfying thing. And every once in a while, uh, something you do can make a real difference in a community. Something you expose, something you, uh, a problem you describe in detail. Um, you know, think of, we have a system of food stamps in our country in significant part because CBS News did an extraordinary piece in the early 1970s on hunger in America. And in a great act of bipartisanship, Bob Dole and George McGovern got together and rewrote the Food Stamp Act. And we really reduced the amount of hunger in the United States. That is because the people who worked on that documentary put that problem before the American people. And the American people said, yes, this is wrong. We've got to fix it. That's pretty cool. So in the current climate today, why should we be hopeful? I put a lot of stock in what happened in 2018. If our country had decided uh, that the direction it chose in 2016 was the right direction, I would actually be very depressed about my country. I would not be hopeful right now. Uh, and it's not about Republican or Democrat or liberal or conservative, although it's clearly connected to those things. Um, but it's about um, a path that I think is, potential, is deeply destructive to some of the best values in the country, whether they be tolerance, whether they be equality, a, wel a welcoming country or a country that really wants to turn people away. And Americans, by a very large margin, decided that's not who we are. So that is one reason I'm hopeful. The second reason I'm hopeful, and I am sure, I would suspect you agree with me on this, because you're in the classroom as I am all the time, um, I really think the next generation up, uh, the, the, the people um, you know, 45 and under, um, will create a better country. Uh, I think they are more open. Uh, they are ready to deal with some of the chaos in the economy that we have. They are, uh, there is less racial prejudice in this group. It's a more diverse uh, group of Americans. And, I always tell my kids that when my generation dies off and they take over, I think the country will be better, and that the only problem is I want to be around to see it. So that's the contradiction in my wish. So those are a few reasons why I am hopeful. E.J. Dion, thank you for being with us tonight. So good to be with you. Thank you. It was fun. Man. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you. Thank you.